Daja Hao. Welcome everyone to the second part of today's webinar. I'm Stuart and I'm one of the application scientists at Edinburgh Instruments. In the second half, I'm going to be explaining how you can disentangle fluorescence and phosphorescence using the FLS 1000 photolumescence spectrometer. A brief outline of my talk. I'm going to start off explaining the different types of photoluminescence and the time scales they occur in. I'm going to then move on to the three photon counting modes in the FLS 1000, TCSPC, MCS, and Kinetic, and explain what types of photoluminescence and what time scales they should be used in. I'm going to then move on to a section on how you can gate the photomultiplier detector and the advantages this has for separating fluorescence from phosphorescence. And finally, I'm going to end with an application example, the characterization of TADF emitters, which involves a combination of all these previous techniques put into practice. That brings me to the first section of the webinar, which is types of photoluminescence and their timescales. I'm sure many people there in the audience are already very familiar with photoluminescence. But for those of you who are new, photoluminescence refers to the emission of light from a material after it has absorbed light. This could be in a molecular system where absorption of a photon promotes the molecule from its ground singlet state into a singlet excited state and then radiative relaxation from these excited states back to the ground state where it's photoluminescence with the emission of photons. Photoluminescence also commonly occurs in semiconducting materials where absorption of a photon promotes the semiconductor an electron from the valence band to the conduction band and the radiative relaxation back to the valence band results in the emission of a photon, and this is also photoluminescence. In molecular systems that have distinct uh, singlet and triplet levels, marked T and S on this diagram, you can further subdivide photoluminescence uh, into fluorescence and phosphorescence, depending on the origin uh, of the state that the light comes from. So the ground states of nearly all molecules are a singlet state. And when the photon is absorbed, the molecule is promoted to a singlet excited state due to conservation of angular momentum. And radiative relaxation from this singlet excited state back to the singlet ground state is called fluorescence. And this has a lifetime of about 10 picoseconds to 100 nanoseconds. Alternatively, after the molecule has been excited uh, to the S1 state, it may undergo an inter-system crossing to the T1 triplet state. And then a radiative relaxation from the triplet state to the ground state results in phosphorescence. And phosphorescence occurs on a longer time scale typically having a lifetime on the one microseconds to 10 seconds region. And this is because it's a, a forbidden transition because you're breaking conservation of angular momentum with this transition. And so phosphorescence occurs on a longer time scale. It's a slower transition. Just a word on what I mean here by lifetime for those of you who are not familiar with fluorescence and phosphorescence lifetimes. The lifetime here refers to the time it takes for a population with intensity I, I naught to fall to, to I naught over E. So the fluorescence or phosphorescence decay starts off with an initial intensity and then it falls to that intensity over E, and the time it takes for it to do that is the lifetime. 
And that's what these values here refer to. It's the time it takes to fall to this uh, one over E value. Fluorescence and phosphorescence are the most uh, common processes that occur in molecules, but a phenomena called delayed fluorescence can also occur. Uh, there are two main types of delayed fluorescence. Uh, on the left here is E-type delayed fluorescence, which is more commonly known now as thermally activated delayed fluorescence, particularly in the OLED research community. So the idea of delayed fluorescence uh, is that the molecule is promoted from its singlet ground state to the singlet excited state, it then undergoes an inter-system crossing to the triplet state, and then a thermally uh, assisted reverse inter-system crossing back to the singlet state. And then the singlet state can radiatively relax, result in the emission of a photon, and that is delayed fluorescence. The other type of delayed fluorescence is known as P-type delayed fluorescence or triplet-triplet annihilation. So this requires at least two molecules. It's a bimolecular process. And how this works is that, again, the molecules are excited to their single excited state. They undergo an inter-system crossing to the triplet. But there's then an interaction between the triplet state of one molecule and the triplet state of another, and they undergo triplet-triplet annihilation. During this process, the, the triplet of one of the molecules is de-excited back down to the singlet ground state, and the triplet of the, the other molecule is excited to its singlet excited state. And then this state can radiatively relax, resulting in delayed fluorescence. Delayed fluorescence tends to occur on a time scale somewhere between fluorescence and phosphorescence. Uh, with typical lifetimes of 100 nanoseconds to one millisecond. The last type of photoluminescence that I'm gonna discuss is persistent luminescence, which is also commonly called afterglow. So this occurs on a much longer time scale than the, the previous ones. And the idea here is that the process involves some kind of trap. So these could be trapping centers located below the conduction band or above the valence band. And electrons in these trapping centers are released, uh, usually in some form of thermally activated process. They then migrate towards luminescent centers where they can uh, radiatively recombine resulting in the emission of light, which is persistent luminescence. This detrapping process is very slow or can be very slow. And so persistent luminescence has much longer lifetimes, typically in the order of seconds to hours or even days uh, due to the slow detrapping uh, process. So I've explained the four main types of photoluminescence that are encountered. And the thing to note is that these cover a very wide time range. We have 10 picoseconds lifetimes being about the shortest fluorescence lifetime. And then for persistent luminescence phosphors they can have lifetimes on the hundreds of hours. And so, to be able to characterize these materials, we need to be able to measure the emission of photons over a very wide range of times. And you require a spectrometer that has a combination of different measurement techniques to cover this entire time range. The FLS 1000 has three single photon counting modes that cover a full 15 decades of time range. For the fastest lifetimes, there's time correlated single photon counting or TCSPC for short. 
For the intermediate, we have multi-channel scaling mode or MCS. And for the longest times, we have kinetic mode. And I'm now going to explain each of these measurement modes in, different, uh, in more detail and explain the types of photoluminescence transitions. They're suitable for measuring and the advantages and disadvantages of each. <laughs> 